The GPS tracker is used to facilitate a variety of epic encounters with the wonders of nature every weekend. Its accuracy can embolden us as we walk in the footsteps of the Romantics, whose poetry responded to the vast perspectives afforded by mountains, cliffs and distance, and who influenced our concepts of beauty, space and self. But it is a politically ambiguous tool. Invented by the military in the 20th century, the very functionality of the device illustrates a continuation of 18th century imperialist ideologies where people and places increasingly become spatialised backgrounds to a notion of the conquering self. For example, romantic literature frequently frames the landscape as mother, but it doesn't leave much room for her as an individual within it. Our notion of the mother at home was, like GPS, developed for imperial purposes. As the domestic familial counterpart to land enclosure at home and imperialism abroad, says Perry in 2006, a white middle-class mother's duty was as a social tool to raise citizens for the state and its empire. In other words, to be a background. As somebody whose artistic walking practice centralises my maternal world, I began to appropriate this tool to express my subjectivity in a challenge to the ongoing aesthetic and political categorizations of that era. My use of GPS serves my desire to separate myself from the historically prescribed tethering of maternal perspectives to the domestic space and my choice of embroidery as a metaphor references and rejects the modest, neat self-expression anticipated from this location. After all, whether or not home is sweet, sometimes we all just want to get out of the house. Tracking my path as I walk, the signal to the satellite of the GPS tracker echoes the to and fro of the embroidery needle, mirroring its accuracy but stitching far from the domestic space in which mothering has been prescribed. By conceiving of the GPS trace as embroidery, I found new ways of thinking about the connections and slippages between the apparent objectivity of a GPS device and the subjectivity which the trace so frequently reveals. A GPS trace combines the awe-inspiring sublimity of which the romantic poets could not have conceived with a myopic attention to detail, which is prescribed of the mother too, but frequently dismissed as too personal in artwork. As with the domestic sampler, if we look more closely at the traces, we see that they contain a detail and individuality unnoticed in this otherwise systematic, regular and nameless work, and that in this interplay lies its greatest interest. It's worth reminding ourselves of the binaries which have shaped this thinking before moving on to the subtleties, however. Distinctions between the sublime and the beautiful were central to Romanticism and its gendered notions of artist and landscape. Romantic scholar Jacqueline Lab explains that romantic awe and wonder also celebrated a sense of intellectual and objective mastery of the sublime in nature, usually constructed as a result of solitary and heroic encounters such as walking. This often focused around the high point of the journey, which was called the prospect view, since it was from here that the colonial prospector could survey as opposed to experience his property. While women and workers laboured within the home or on the land, this controlled and controlling perspective was beyond their reach, both in practical and aesthetic ways. Only those who can achieve the enlightenment of sublime and far-reaching perspectives could expect to achieve the selfhood deemed to define the artist. Meanwhile, women were cultivated 
to concentrate on the details of flowers, fruit or textiles. Composition on a broader scale was to be done by eyes and hands which had been sufficiently trained to do so, so women's accomplishments were more modestly appreciated within the domestic sphere. Furthermore, male romantic poets frequently describe the landscape as a selfless maternal presence against whose mute benevolence and comfort he can articulate himself as a child. Dear nature is the kindest mother still, exclaims Byron. In a post-enlightenment era that connects the irrationality of sentiment to women, male artists wish to avoid being what Rousseau describes as those foppish mannequins who are a disgrace to their own sex and to the sex which they imitate. The construction of the self as child allowed the male poet to show increased sensitivity towards the, the sublime and the beautiful in nature while circumventing any association with the feminine that this might invoke. These factors combined to construct a ladder of artistic value which sees the objective, generalised, grand sweep of the history painting or epic poem at the top and the detailed, personal, domestic activities of embroidery, flower painting or letter writing at the bottom. We have not erased these ways of thinking today. The ideology that the Romantics conceived remains a powerful cultural reference. The metaphors inherent in terms such as mother country, home office or domestic policy are not coincidental. In contemporary political media, the desire to protect the Romantic landscape is still used to support a nostalgic and nationalist agenda, while more subtly, Enjoyment of these spaces echoes classed and racialized performance of the same sensibilities that the Romantics prescribed. I have sought ways to think about how to articulate my own maternal identity beyond these traditional expectations, particularly after the Brexit referendum, where re reiterations of the politics anticipated when a woman speaks as a mother were used as part of the Conservative Party leadership debate. In response, I wrote the words of romantic artist mothers across the landscape. Here are some examples. Thou steered them wrong, thou helmsman vile, I wrote in Blenavon, originally written by Mary Howitt. Weary toil subdued, I reached a country strange and rude, was one I wrote on the White Cliffs of Dover, originally composed by Matilda Betton. In reinscribing political statements from the past, a diachronic form of performance writing has emerged, creating dialogues between myself, the words and the location, and raising questions about who may write what and where in and about this country. Embroidering a foot writing, which is legible, revises the focus of the GPS from the sublime to the myopic. In revisiting the shape of letters, a careful and corporeal cartography of joined up writing, simultaneously superimposed on and interrupted by the landscape, emerges. GPS signals are at an interval of a couple of seconds, so a stitch is shorter or longer depending on my speed. To make a curve, you have to walk slower. There's pleasure in writing an S or an H, but an A is difficult and usually ends up a bit ugly. It makes me think about how letters are called characters because they have them. I find their shape in small details, I loop them around the tufts of sorrel or nettles. I use a fence post as a marker to return to. I use the trail I create in wet or long grass or paths made by walkers or animals as another guide to keep my writing semi-straight. Walls and fences can hinder or help depending on whether they follow my line of writing 
or whether they intersect it. In fact, the GPS trace doesn't show where I walked, only where the tracker was taken. And sometimes that's not the same. Already having a task to fulfil, I receive my surroundings as a companion, not a muse. In contrast to the romantic wandering hero, the results do not filter the land through my aesthetically trained eye or pen. They are records of a laboured process. The act of writing is affected by my own physicality and that of the location, my co-performer. Temporarily a worker in the landscape, my focus is on its details, not its potential. The actual thoughts I have on the walk are not recorded. Whether or not the thoughts of somebody labouring in rather than looking over a landscape matter is another question. To begin with, my focus was on the legibility of these embroideries. But as the process has developed, I have become more intrigued by what they show about that dangerously irrational and feminine notion of sentiment and feeling mentioned earlier. I've been surprised at the level of my own emotion as I walk about, purposeful and yet directionless. The reflexive experience has created a level of sympathy for that other romantic figure, the tragic woman wildly wandering in the landscape, which is something I did not expect. Embroidering at Stonehenge, the location where single mother Tess of the D'Urbervilles is arrested, I was surprised at the level of anger I had on behalf of a fictional character and at the connections I made as I walked between her and contemporary women. When I got there, I realised that the monument is surrounded by army barracks, where wives of low-ranking soldiers sit waiting in bleak homes while tanks roll out of the barbed wire no-go areas across the public road and disappear again into no man's land. I wrote, I hail the law, formed to serve the strong. In vain we argue, rail or chide. My walk was, and though this is not visible on the GPS trace, its temporal connection to my body and emotion is not wholly separate either. This has led me to focus more deeply on the personal aspect of our traces, which appear so disembodied and yet are records of minute details and decisions made about paths taken or ignored and of the bodies and minds that made them. With the support of the Arts Council and a live art development agency residency, I have been leading workshops with other people who mother to further experience the possibilities of writing in this way. Though embroidering with a GPS tracker is quite solitary, it allows participants time to think, together but alone. Some have described how relaxing they found it to commit to this task bodily and to allow the mind to fluctuate between letter, shape and concept between materiality of sand or brambles and technology. Others have seen the restriction of the letters as a metaphor for the restrictions on wandering placed on women. The durational necessity of this performance could be read as a feminist Marxist acknowledgement of bodily labour, and it is for some people I walk with. But it's also a simple focusing on detail, noticing the characters of letters and the tools we use to make them. Having spent so long at this stage of word level writing, reteaching adults is an interesting process. Not only does the act echo childhood experiences of learning joined up handwriting, but the connections which Tim Ingold makes between weaving, walking and writing are revealed in the flow that is required. Furthermore, the fact of being in the landscape as opposed to looking at it like a page, means the writer's constantly required to consider their own spatial position in relation to letters that they can't see from above. Some people have to draw the letter in the air in front of them to relearn the connections between the shapes. It's a bodily, not a visual act, 
more akin in some ways to speech than writing. Pre-digital scholars have made much of this distinction between bodily acts such as speech and more permanent written expression. Walter Ong tells us that writing lacks a connection to its source because tone, facial expression and bodily gesture are stripped away. And yet, the foot writing of my participants differs hugely. This one says, straighten up and fly right. We walk on the bed of the sea of the air. Wild family dancing in chaos. I don't know what this one says but the participant is dyslexic and wrote everything back to front. La mer et la mer. Though the GPS traces have the permanence of writing, they reveal the imperfections of speech and action. Some of my embroideries are more legible than others. Some are unfinished or interrupted by the landscape. Some are records of a huge effort to articulate something, but what it is, is lost. Frequently, participants are frustrated at this, but I believe this illegibility offers a further response to the romantic conceptions of the maternal. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, often called the father of romantic walking, was also the hugely influential writer of the first parenting manual, which spawned a plethora of these in the 18th century. I also can't resist pointing out that he left his own children in an orphanage, but that's not central to my point here. As is the case today, these books may well be well meant, but are sometimes conflicting or impossible to follow. Historian Rebecca Davis suggests that this is because idealised maternity cannot be performed, only written, as the written word is considered parenting, perfected through careful thought, end quote. The lived experience of parenting, by contrast, is nothing if not immediate. In the moment, Faced with real or metaphorical obstacles like the lack of spatial or digital skills, bad preparation, distraction or all the shortcomings of one's own body, the individual's embroidery may be messy, misguided, illegible or even deviant. Reminiscent of 19th century domestic samplers which warn of God's constant witness, the GPS is another kind of surveillance. It's a 21st century panopticon. It details and declares the inefficiencies in our walking. It shows where we have followed the route of others or where we've intentionally strayed from or struggled to maintain the directions that previous consensus has laid out. Unlike the retrospective representations of the map, which are probably not the actual journey of even the most proficient navigator, this recording of walked embroidery is created in the moment and so is far from ideal. The threads and knots cannot be reworked or hidden at the back of the canvas here. They are there for all to see. The display of our own imperfections then becomes a challenge to the idea of maternal perfection itself, replacing prescribed domestic representations with lived, scribbled reality. GPS embroidery queries the objective and dispassionate perspective it uses. Although it surveys and locates us, the GPS device contrasts the idealised, romantically spatialised mother by showing her activities as a subject, not as landscape or background, but fallible, human and individual. But we must be careful here. In claiming GPS, we might argue that the solitary pin of the GPS tracker reflects back an individual subject position that I am not alone in having craved. And yes, in this mediated image, 
we are offered a representation of our encounter with the sublimity of space or technology, which could mistakenly confirm a heroic narrative, where we too are revealed against a supportive and silent background. But as we zoom out, becoming tinier and tinier on a map that covers an area greater than the limits of the furthest horizon, the screen, in fact, inverts the power of the prospect view by reminding us that we are not separate from the world below or around us, but a dot within it. Recent discourses on walking reveal increased attention to the relationship between body and landscape, evidenced in the new responses to the work of Nan Shepherd or Dorothy Wordsworth, for example. This relational approach is how I would like to end, bringing my focus back to the sublimity of GPS space and the easy to forget fact that the device functions by positioning itself against at least three separate satellites. Confounding singularity, the GPS tracker relies on something the romantic poet and many a contemporary solitary walker chooses to ignore, that the individual can only locate themselves as such by referring to others. GPS, like most orientational devices, is, after all, a relational tool. The residues of romantic, heroic individualism may prompt many to pick up their tracker to find or record themselves in the wilds of landscape. But I hope I have indicated that a tracker can also destabilise notions of singularity, individuality or child genius in favour of something more appropriate to the 21st century. <laughs>